everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Saan man panig po kayo ng mundo na roon. Welcome sa episode number 93 ng Stop COVID Deaths webinar series brought to you by the University of the Philippines. Thank you for being a part of our credible online community and to all those who have just discovered us for today. Sana po masayahan po kayo at tuloy-tuloy na po ang inyong pagtangkilik sa aming webinar series. Dalawang taon na po tayo sa ating uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have seen how the infection uh, has been traveling from one part of the world to another. Tila po ganoon in a matter of days or even hours. Ang mga bansa po ngayon, uh, kasabay po noon, uh, they are on edge in relation po dun sa Russian invasion of Ukraine ngayong pong panahon ng pandemic. Uh, so aside po from the increasing number of cases na mapapansin nyo po in South Korea, in Hong Kong, in other neighboring countries that we have, uh, yun po po ang isang alalahanin dahil po uh, iniisip po nila, can this war in Europe result in other dangers uh, for those who are far away, relatively far away? Uh, Nai-report na rin po sa balita that Russia has started to use banned weapons. Uh, meron din pong pag-uusap about the threat of chemical as well as other nuclear weapons. Ano po ba ang mga threats na ito? Bilang frontline healthcare workers, ano po ba ang kailangan po nating malaman? Kaugnay ng mga chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, uh, and explosives po. Uh, and other events that could affect Large groups of people in different parts of the world. If you want the latest science-based and evidence-based information from our panel of distinguished experts, keep it right here. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of National Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Always a pleasure to be with all of you during our regular Friday lunch date. Uh, and always looking forward to Fridays uh, in sharing hosting duties with my beloved mentor, our adjunct research faculty at National Telehealth Center. Also, the Special Envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie, maganda po ang topic natin today. Hi, Raymond. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat in the Philippines. And um, for those who are watching from different parts of the work, world, ano mang oras dyan, we hope you're doing okay, that you're fine. We'd like to welcome you to the webinar. As Raymond said, we have a very, very interesting topic and we have brought to the best possible speakers on this topic and so i think we're all um watching what will happen to this uh war in in europe although i think more or less people are happier now na medyo sabi nga eh tano sabi ni ted kanina tail end of the pandemic no pero nakikita natin yung mga kapitbahay nating bansa nagkakaroon ng surge and um Parang patong-patong, hindi pa natatapos yung isang problema, meron na namang isang problema. Dumarating, no, ito yung gera na nakikita natin. Now, what will happen in the future, we don't know. But because we are um, into pandemic preparedness, this is an opportunity for us to learn what are these chemical weapons? What are the health impacts of some kind of a nuclear detonation? Are there biological weapons that could come to our to our country? So, an, ano ano ba yung ibang possible disruptions? No, and what have we learned from the COVID nineteen pandemic that we can apply now to any kind of major health disruption? So, um, Raymond, I don't know, no, two years na ano ba sabi mo kanina ninety three ninety three episodes na ba? So grabe. It's been a long time and but you know I think we're we're um we're hanging on in there and I think until you know as long as there there is there are emergencies or situations that we need to talk to talk about we'll be here for you and we're so happy that you're here always nice to see the same uh the same uh group our community pero marami ring bagong mga naidadagdag so anyway I just wanted to remind all of you that we are now approaching our um our second anniversary, and we'll talk about the memorial later. So, Raymond, over to you muna for POTS. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Especially for those who are joining us sa uh, unang-unang beses po, no? we usually put our discussion in context by providing you uh, a, a, an interview video na tinatawag po namin person on the street or POTS interview video. For our video for today, ang tanong po that we post our interviewees, nasa isang party po kayo, kunwari. Tapos biglang mayroon kayo na amoy at maraming nahirapang huminga. Ano ang inyong gagawin? Please watch this. Ah, kung may makikita akong nahirapang huminga, so, uh, 
sa tingin ko unang medyo magpapanik, <laughs> magpapanik ako. Tapos, hahanap ako ng ano, uh, hahanap ako ng taong mga katulong na uh, mag-respond to sa sitwasyon. So, kung nasa party, so yung organizer. Siguro, una kong gagawin is takpan muna yung ilong. Uh, since hindi tayo sigurado kung anong nahamoy natin, then find the nearest exit. As soon as na-secure na yung exit na yun, uh, call everyone's attention to lead them to safety. And when everything is clear, um, saka na tayo tumawag ng emergency. Well, unang-una hanapin ko muna ano yung source ng amoy. And then after nun, tingnan ko yung sitwasyon sa paligid ko, kung ano yung ginagawa ng mga tao. At tapos, according doon, saka lang ako gagawa na action. Ano ako, sir, yung tawag dito, yung mapapanik na ako, sir. Kasi nakikita ko lahat na ano yan. Kapag ganun, sir, nangyari, siyempre itatawag sa mga ano, sir. Halimbawa sa malapit sa amin, para kung para agad kami matulungan. To be honest, magpapanik muna ako ng konti. But after a while, I think, um, I'll try to see kung ano yung reason behind. Uh, but sila nahihirapan huminga. And then, find someone find someone who can address yung problem kung bakit sila nahihirapan huminga. Kung ako ang organizer, mas mararamdaman kung ako yung main responsible to respond. Kapag ano, na, um, titingin ako sa ano, mga guests ng party, kung may doktor ba o hindi. Kung hindi, uh, kung wala, saka lang ako maghahanap ng tulong halimbawa sa kapitbahay, O kaya tatawag ako kung may kakilala akong doktor, o kaya kung malapit yung barangay hall. Mag-ingat pa. Hindi tayo nakakasiguro sa pakugit. Tulad ng mga ganitong sakuna, dapat mag-ingat pa rin siya. Be careful pa din. Um, as much as they can. Kasi yung na-realize ko this year, some people, even if gusto nilang mag-follow ng health protocols, hindi nila magawa for different kinds of reasons. So as much as they can, still be careful and still follow yung mga health protocols. On mute, thank you very on much. Uh, th thank you very much, TVUP. So it's very interesting to know what people on the ground are are thinking and um nakakatakot nga naman Raymond ano palagi ko ako magpapanic din ako that's the normal game, reaction pa <laughs> parang ano eh parang game of thrones eh di ba yung biglang na ano biglang marami na, nahihimatay o hindi makahinga but i think um you know nowadays we want to be prepared for any kind of situation so thank you to VUP for getting that person on the street perspective so i was about to cue kanina which is mali, Raymond, di ba? Kasi ngayon ko pa lang dapat i-cue yung second year anniversary natin. So we are we are going to have our second year anniversary. Um, and as you know, last year, we did a memorial for all of the frontliners who sacrificed by giving their lives uh, in the service of ano, no, people who had COVID-19. So we are uh, still making a call for photographs of family members, friends, um, colleagues who passed away because of COVID and we would need a high resolution portrait, at least 300 dots per inch. Oh, alam ko na yun, ha? dots per inch. And then full name, date of birth, date of death and occupation. So we're still collecting that up to April 9 po. Um, and we, again, you know, we, we feel that we should not forget those who those who gave the ultimate ultimate act of service and uh, actually lost their lives in this pandemic. So it's going to be, a, what should I say, a moment of looking back when we do our second year anniversary of looking back at what we learned. And um, in that process, we don't want to forget those who, who we lost in this battle. So Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Um, the Filipino medical frontliners po kasi has been recognized as the best, if not one of the best of uh, the world in terms of our response and being part of uh, the COVID, not the global COVID-19 response. So we hope to be able to immortalize 
uh, their selfless contributions po uh, sa laban po against COVID-19. Um, uh, ulitin ko lang po, inaayahan po namin lahat na magbigay po ng inyong mga pictures. Maybe you have a short anecdote na kasaway po noon. So please uh, share it with us. Uh, we'll be more than happy to include that in the COVID-19 memorial po. Um, just to let everyone know, our webinar can accommodate up to a maximum of 3,000 participants. Uh, so please join us sa Zoom para po ma-experience po ninyo ang, ang fully interactive na program po natin. Meron din tayong um, well presence in via the live stream sa YouTube and Facebook. So hopefully you'll also be able to participate in our activities here for our webinar. We have parallel discussions happening in the chat box. Meron din po sa comment section sa YouTube at sa Facebook. Pero sana po lahat po kayo ay makapag-participate po rito. Uh, for those who are asking, alam ko po lahat po may mga, marami po nagtatanong patungkol po sa certificates of attendance. Nakapag-release na po kami for the last 91 webinars po ng lahat-lahat um, po ng certificates of attendance na meron po. Hindi pa po, may mga mailan-ilan pa po na hindi pa po na kakatanggap ng webinar 92 na certificate. So please let us know, uh, especially those who have watched at least 50% of the webinar duration. We'd also like to take this opportunity to invite everyone, lahat-lahat po. Sana po uh, we are seeing uh, konti na lang po, magiging 800 participants na po tayo sa Zoom. Uh, sana po makapag-participate po kayo sa ating fun quiz, ang ating pre-test po, uh, and those who will be participating by going to www.menti.com So, if you go to that, open your browser, type in that in the address bar, and then if you could enter the code, ano po ba ang code natin? Hindi ko po makita. Sa, sa, ano? sa on the screen? 7995-3493 Yun, okay. That's 7995-3143 So, if you... 34-3493 34-3493 So, if you're able to... Um, Participate po, no? Uh, we know you're participating kasi baka po mas madali po sa inyo ang YouTube at Facebook. Uh, but hopefully you're still able to participate sa ating menti. Uh, today's webinar, will be utilizing our standard panel discussion format uh, with our set of speakers. Meron lang po tayong special participation all the way from outside of the Philippines. So we are very, very thankful for our guest expert po. Uh, but before we get to her, uh, we will have uh, a whole... Uh, set of discussions din po na, and we are glad that she'll be able to join us during the Q&A session as well. We're in. We will be entertaining questions coming in sa lahat po, whether YouTube, Facebook, or dito po sa Q&A box ng Zoom. So without further ado, Dr. Susie will introduce our opening remarks speaker. Okay, I know you're very excited to get this discussion on the way and um, for our introductory remarks, opening remarks, of course, fitting that we're bringing in our own in-house uh, expert on disasters, emergencies, and trauma. Kilala niyo po siya. Siya po ngayon ang chairman ng Department of Emergency uh, Emergency Medicine sa UPPGH. And um, he is the senior advisor of the National Task Force Against COVID-19. And you see him a lot on social media. And he has done really heroic efforts in the vaccination campaign. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Ted Darbosa. Ted, welcome. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Raymond. And uh, good afternoon to all the um, hundreds and hundreds of followers of Stop COVID Deaths for the past 93, 93 episodes. Wow. 93. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, go ahead, Ted. Yeah, so right now we have a nice topic. Always our job in the emergency department is unique because they don't come with a steady flow of patients like in a clinic where people line up and queue up and then we actually have moments wherein uh, several patients come together all at the same time and we don't understand why there are a seasonal and there is also time of the day wherein we have many cases but the most horrible part of being an emergency medicine doctor is when you are suddenly deluged with hundreds of patients with a specific problem. Like uh, the last one I can remember in April was chair of this one, our speaker, when we had all these cases that were poisoned with methanol from a fiesta that served tuba or lambanog that had a high content of methanol. And uh, it was a, a, a big problem. And I'm, ha I'm happy that uh, Stop COVID Deaths has gone to this particular area. It's an area not many doctors actually go into because it's not very common. 
Uh, the interesting thing about uh, being an emergency doctor or disaster medicine doctor is we're the ones that always ask the question, what if? And that's what the question Susie that actually asked. What if they start to use chemical weapons? What if they start to use biologic weapons? And what if they start to use radionuclear weapons? And what will happen to us? And that question always bothers us in the field of emergency care because no hospital is prepared for any of those. And I bet, uh, in fact, probably the only hospital I saw that was prepared was the hospital I trained in, which was in the state of Israel. But Israel is a different story. And in New York in the mid 90s, they did a CBRNE simulation drill. And what they found was 50% of the doctors and nurses were actually affected by the agents that were used during the simulation because of lack of knowledge. And this is very important because we're, we're just finishing, uh, we're just ending, hopefully we're in the tail end of a global pandemic that saw how unprepared the health system is in terms of everything. And this is where I get to with the final part of my message. The, the fact that uh, many doctors try to impose their own set of uh, criteria and uh, norms and frameworks to a situation as complex as chemical, biological, radionuclear events or mass casualty incidents. And I'll give you one of the things my professor, uh, Sten Lenquist, a uh, famous Swedish surgeon that uh, looked into disaster medicine principles. He had only three very important principles of disaster medicine, whether it's a chemical or a traumatic mass ca casualty like a plane crash. He enumerates three. Number one, he said, lower your level of ambition. What does that mean? You know, we're so used to giving everything to a patient that has... Uh, what we need, you know, do everything that you, in your power to save a patient life. But in a mass casualty setting, you can't do that kind of ambition. So you lower your level of ambition. And this is, I think, the fault and the arguments that we kept having over the past year because many of the infectious disease and critical care people failed to lower their ambition in time when there is a pandemic. Second, second is mobilize your resources. We are lucky. Many people complained why... We have so many generals in the national task force, but I'm thankful that we had so many generals in the task force because they actually know how to mobilize resources. In fact, the vaccination program that Susie actually mentioned is the biggest vaccination campaign this country ever implemented and probably even the most successful because we only vaccinate about 2 million children annually. We vaccinated 65 million people with two doses of a vaccine against COVID-19 and the effects are visible. So that's very important, mobilization of resources. Where do you get your, your uh, antidotes? Where do you get your uh, protective equipment to protect your doctors and nurses? And how do you mobilize all of this? And see, of course, third, third and last, it to be able to prioritize which patients will live and which patients will die. And this is not playing God this is all about evidence-based medicine. And if you don't study the chemical agents, you don't study what happens in a nuclear bomb, you'll never know who to triage and you'll, never, you'll be wasting resources, time, and effort. So with those three, I think this will be a good segue, Susie, for our speaker, the former chair, to actually talk a little bit about her experiences, her training, because I'm proud to say that PGH is one of those that looked into this and is prepared uh, in a small way because we have uh, trained for CBRN and we have a small unit with some equipment, not a lot of equipment, but uh, we're one of the agencies of government that have tried to prepare for this. And of course, in the Philippine General Hospital, is also our poison center with our experts in CBRE in connection to our national government. So I'm very happy that we have taken on this challenge to study this concept of uh, all the difficult uh, problems in mass casualties. Thank you very much, Susie. Back to you. Hi, thank you very much, Ted. And I hope you'll be able to stay for the discussion. I think we're going to have a really interesting, interesting discussion. And uh, for those of you who have questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box. Okay, so we told, we said, Karina, we have brought you the best, um, the best speakers, including our introductory speaker, Ted, who's very you know he's 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 seen all of these all he's had so much experience in this area but he's also saying uh, 
hindi tayo prepared, no? So I think, you know, we we really have to talk about this because um, our our survival depends on our preparedness, no? Okay, so our first speaker, all right, of coming all to a, uh, coming to us all the way from Lyon, France, who um is the first and only toxicology institutionalized the first and only toxicology fellowship program in the Philippines, served as the program director for clinical toxicology fellowship based at the then National Poison Control and Information Service at the Philippine General Hospital. But I'd just like to add that um, our guest has been like a voice in the wilderness on chemical, biological, radiation, nuclear, and explosive uh, explosives threats. For many, many years, she has, she has been saying that we have to prepare for this. We have to get ready because a time might come when this could happen and we need to know what we should be doing. Um, and, you know, so we thought we really could not do this webinar without her because she pioneered in this area and is still internationally recognized as the Philippine expert in this field. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Irma Macalino, who is uh, awake early in France and uh, is joining us for the webinar. Welcome, Irma. Okay. Um, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to the different participants of this webinar. Of course, I'd like to greet my classmate, Dr. Susie, <laughs> Dr. Raymond, and of course, it was good to be following the opening remarks of Dr. Herbosa. Because it gives me, you know, flashbacks about how we first started the proposal to create the DEMS program, the emergency medicine program, and the fellowship program of the UP National Poison Control Information Service for the training of toxicologists. So there's a, a bit of history with a collaboration with Dr. Herbosa as well. So let me begin by uh, uh, bringing you to this issue about the interviews that you did where most of the people talked about fear and panic. That is a natural reaction. That was the same kind of reaction that I actually had when I was there during the World Trade Center 9-11 tragedy. I was not in New York. I was actually in an area where it was very close to the Pentagon, and I was actually standing in front of the uh, a place in the George Washington University because I was on my way out, and I saw that there was smoke in that particular area of the Pentagon. So when I went back, that's, that was when I saw that there were people falling from buildings and there was a lot of chaos. So what will we now feel if such an event happens in the Philippines? So that was actually the moving factor for me that changed my career path from being a practitioner in pediatrics and also a clinical toxicologist to one that actually tried to move towards uh, what they called at that time a man's field, and that is the area of chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosives domain, starting now not to train medical doctors first, but really training our first responder community made up of the fire, the police, and to a certain extent, I have also worked with the army in their training for CBRN. But somewhere along the line, I asked myself again, what if we now have several victims whom we have successfully taken out of the initial what zone, which we call the hot zone or the red zone into a cold zone. And there's no receiving hospital. There's no medical doctor or healthcare provider that can really manage these patients. So having said that, I realized that that is the missing link of all the capacity building that the Philippines has received over the years since 9-11. So I also went back to an experience of seeing patients who were victims of the Iran-Iraq war when I visited uh, Iran for the medical CBRN training I received. Seeing those victims who survived actually after a mustard agent exposure was really heartbreaking. And some of them even verbalized that maybe it was better for them to have died on site than to suffer all this exposure, uh, residual effects such as blindness, a difficulty of breathing that cannot be relieved by the common agents that we give. And, and of course, the, they consistently, uh, they're persistently scratching themselves because of the effect on the skin. And so you can see the nail marks that are already in their bodies because they really are scratching very hard. So that's just a scenario where the victims sometimes feel that uh, 
being being a survivor isn't necessarily a good thing. But of course, we want to save lives. It's interesting also to see that while our normal impulse as medical doctors is to save people, we also have to remember that if we don't know, we should not go. So when I teach people now, I will always tell them bravery is not really a measure of what you should be doing. If you don't know, please don't go to the scene. That's the thing that I keep reiterating now because you can be the next victim of that particular instance. But here, when I look back to the experience of um, the people in Iran during that uh, particular instance in their history, some of the doctors are now suffering from the exposure to nerve agents because they were not aware of what particular chemical weapon was used. And therefore, they simply went to the site and started uh, looking at the patients. And now they have the permanent disability, a neurologic disability that follows some of the nerve agent exposure. So in all of this, I think that when Susie mentioned being a voice in the wilderness, it took a long time for our government to see the value of having this training now also focused on the medical community and successfully, at least even if that particular unit in PGH is quite small, it has done a good job during the pandemic as well. It has done a good job for the methanol poisoning. It has done a very good job during the ammonia incident. I don't know if people recognize that we had an ammonia ice plant explosion that led to several patients being brought to the Philippine General Hospital and to other hospitals uh, within the area of Metro Manila. So we can see the, that that particular training that people are receiving for CBRN is not, is not limited to CBRN per se, but can also be translated to other a hazardous material incident. So by and large, I think what I just want to say now is that as the world looks at the medical community now and the role that we will play, as people are threatened by the possibility that there will really be a use of these agents during this period in human history between the, uh, uh, during this Ukraine and Russian war, we need to be more prepared. But I think the issue here is that it is always difficult to follow what we usually do as medical doctors, to treat every patient. And that's also to echo what Dr. Herbosa was saying. In the principle of CBR and mass casualty events, we cannot manage to treat all patients. So the dictum is the greater good for the greatest number of people. And so we work by that paradigm, and I do hope that this particular workshop will give us an idea about the different kinds of preparedness that we have at the moment and what, uh, what additional training we need. Just to uh, segue now uh, and give hope, there is a pending uh, medical CBRN training that we are negotiating also for the EU CBRN Centers of Excellence. And with that, I really want to say um, I am very happy in some ways that we are now open to the discussion on CBRN, considering that even in the COVID-19 pandemic, we had explosions in Holosulu that really gave you an idea that explosives were used. We had international events that showed us this, that Novichok, which is a nerve agent, was used. And this was, again, something that uh, gives us an idea that there is a continuing interest in the use of chemical weapons. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Irma. Ako, galing ni Irma. No? <laughs> Hindi ka alis, Irma. Ha? Please stay. Because, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we want we want to have a good discussion. And really, um, I think uh, Irma has really um, summarized for us how urgent this is. Naisip ko nga, Irma, nagsasalita ka. Eh. Baka with DVUP, maybe we should have really a specialized training on this, even if it's not skills, it's just information. Yes. Kasi ano eh, no, parang it can happen. And it can happen sooner than we know. Anyway, lat mamaya pag-usapan natin. Yun. So thanks so much, Irma. I'm sure our audience really appreciates your, your words of wisdom on this, but we're looking forward to having you in the discussion. All right. So let's start with our first, um, with our presentation Uh Oh, not yet. Not yet our presentation proper. We, we have our pre-test, Dr. Susie. Oh, magpa-fan quiz muna si Raymond. Okay, game Raymond. Let's go. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Makalinao, all the way from Lyon in uh, France. Uh, and thank you for waking up so early <laughs> and gracing us with your presence. Thank you also for agreeing to join us in the Q&A section uh, later on. Uh, nabangita po ni Dr. Irma the important role that frontline healthcare workers will play and hopefully that's something that uh, all the learnings that we will take away from this webinar with regards to prevention, mitigation, uh, maybe even treatment kung ano pa po ang makukuha po natin for this webinar ay mag magamit po natin uh, or at least ma-impact po ang sa ating knowledge base yung mga yon para in fact kung magamit po natin in the future. That's something that we are aware of. And just to remind everyone, for the Q&A session of this webinar, we will choose uh, from the most upvoted questions po, no? kung ano po yung mga katanungan, um, itatanong ng live sa ating mga guest experts po sa ating panel. So, if your question is selected, as may makikita po kayong, um, uh, we will promote you to panelists, uh, sana po paunlakan nyo po kami at pumayag po kayo na mag-join po at itanong ang inyong katanungan uh, to, for you to be able to ask live to our panel of experts. So, so we encourage everyone to start typing in your questions right now. Kung meron po kayo, uh, pati rin po sa mga nasa Facebook at YouTube po, itype nyo lang po sa comment section ang kahit ano po yung katanungan. Meron po nag scour at nag scan po ng uh, comment section for us to be able to choose which questions will be asked. Before we proceed, can we have on the screen the two questions and also on the Zoom poll po? The two questions are as follows. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting for that, sorry, I'm not sure if it's on my end. But the first question is, what? Okay, ito na po pala. What is the most common uh, route of exposure of hazmat incidents? So, uh, tatlo po yan. Tatlo po ang katanung ang options po jan. Dermal, inhalational. At oral. So, yun po ang mga katanungan. I'm not sure if you're able to see it on the screen yung sa menti, but at least yung mga nasa Zoom po, nandito po sa ating Zoom poll. We'd like to greet those who are joining us. Marami po kasing nag-join sa atin. Uh, locally pa mo muna, uh, batiin lang po namin yung mga nasa Black Nazarene Hospital in San Nicolas, Ilocos Norte. Cagayan Valley Medical Center in Tugegarao. The Provincial Planning and Development Office in Mamburao, Occidental Mindoro. Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines in Calibo, Aklan, Visaya State University Infirmary Hospital in Baybay, Leyte, Ignacio Lacson Arroyo Memorial District Hospital in Isabela, Negros Occidental, and the Davao del Norte Hospital Igacos Zone in Island Garden City of Samal, Sock Surgeon General Hospital in Surala, South Cotabato, the City Health Office of Cotabato City, and the Provincial Health Office of Marawi City. For our question number two, uh, it reads, for exposure to solids or liquids, a rapid removal of the clothing is the single most important step in decontamination. It removes blank of contaminants. So, ano po ang ng contaminants ang nare-remove kapag nakakaroon po ng pagtatanggal ng damit, kapag na-expose po? Uh, is it 20 to 25%? Option 2, 30 to 40%. Option 3, 75 to 80%. And option 4, 80 to 90 percent. Uh, we will not be closing our fun quiz po. We'll try to greet those who are joining us all the way from the National Center for Global Health and Medicine in Japan, Chonin Hospital in Taipei, Taiwan, Ministry of Health in Bandar Seri, Bigawan in Brunei, Nguyen Thai Hock Polyclinics in Vietnam, Bukit Murtajam in Malaysia, Seha Al Dafra Hospitals in Abu Dhabi, King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, the Northern Border University in Arar, Saudi Arabia, Qasim University, Buraida, Saudi Arabia, University of Ha'il in Saudi Arabia, Linchi Ali University of Blida II in Algeria, Stockton, California, Edmonton in Alberta, Canada, and St. Eustatius Auxiliary Home Foundation from the Netherlands, Antilles. Okay po, so we are still waiting for those uh, who will want to join at least for us ating fun quiz. Uh, but we will now move on to the main presentation po, and Dr. Susie will introduce our main presenter. Thank you very much, Raymond, and uh, very interesting questions. No? I hope those little quizzes, we call them a fun quiz, but it's really to help us you know, continue learning and remembering uh, key points um, in, in uh, doing our frontline work. Okay, so our first speaker. Our first speaker... Right, we're very happy to have her here. And we said we are bringing you only the best 
speakers for this topic. Uh, she is a former chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at uh, UPPGH. And um, again, another person, if you meet her in, in, in public, you won't think that she's so knowledgeable in this, in this area. Kasi napaka-quiet niya, napaka-ganon. Pero ano yung 20 degrees sa emergency room? De. Very good in emergency medicine. Okay, and I would say also a champion of uh, CBRNE. So I'd like to welcome Dr. April Ganeta. April, welcome. Saan si April? Uh, she should be here. Ooh, did we lose April? I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm asking her to unmute and open her video, Dr. Susie. Uh oh. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, she has trouble connecting. Off. Yeah, yeah. She dropped off for a while. Okay, wait. So we'll try to have April um, reconnect. So let's give that a minute or two. Wala pa, no? Okay, so anyway, um, while we're waiting for uh while we're waiting for for April to to come on board, what is the latest on COVID now, uh, Raymond, sa mga discussions nyo? Ah, okay. So right now, more and more municipalities, uh, highly urbanized cities, component cities po are getting de-escalated uh, to alert level one, which is a good sign, uh, especially with the vaccination coverage being used as a metric po for the de-escalation. So we are happy to see that. But uh, what is a little bit, uh, well, at the back of our minds po, no? we are trying to uh, figure out also why the Philippines is not yet experiencing ano po yun na experience po sa ibang mga bansa, uh, which is something na, is, 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 parang ang tanong po is, is this something that we should be anticipating na mangyayari or hindi na ba siya mangyayari sa atin? Kasi when in fact, if you look at, let's say, in Singapore, uh, in South Korea, etc., talagang uh, it's as if they were, yung kung ano po tayo, nung January, ganun din po sila. So, uh, that's always at the back of uh, our minds and something that we should really be preparing for uh, at the very least. We have been seeing, and I think this has been our conversation before Dr. Susie, we have been seeing... Um, large crowds yung parang sa, sa mga election rallies etc which uh, we feel uh, if not for the vaccines at the very least and for masking uh, talagang super spreader events po yun. so we hope there wouldn't be any such cases po that uh, would push the Philippines back in terms of uh, a return to the rise of cases po na, na ano po natin so I yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Raymond. No, because I was just talking to some folks in the Red Cross. They were saying that actually, wala nang magpapatest. No, so yeah, you're right. The question is, are we uh, na una ba tayo dito sa mga nagsasurge? O, yes, yes. Or or nagsasurge ba sila tayo susunod tayo? Anyway, okay. Dr. April uh, Leneta is back, uh, and uh, she is going to now give the main presentation. April, welcome back. Please take the floor. Um, you have to unmute, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So I'll share my slides. Okay. So before I start, I'd like to thank po, uh, the organizers of the webinar for this opportunity to share with everybody uh, my experiences and uh, what I have learned as a member and leader of the CBRN team of the Philippine General Hospital. And I'm also glad that my mentors in uh, both in emergency medicine and in CBRN are here. Um, and uh, thank, I would like to thank them for the opportunity to work uh, in this particular field no? um, in, uh, uh, in CBRNE. So the title of my presentation is uh, CBRNE Incident Response. 
So I'll cover, I'll give an overview of CBRNE and give you some cases uh, and we'll describe the role of the healthcare workers and uh, outline an approach to a hazmat patient. So of course the CBRNE uh, term is an acronym for biological or rather chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive agents. No? So these are substances that are harmful to both uh, people and the environment. So you may be more familiar with the term hazmat. No? So it uh, the, the refers to the same set of uh, substances, harmful substances. But if you talk to experts, especially those in law enforcement and uh, security, uh, they will tell you that there's a line that differentiates between a hazmat incident and a CBRNE event. And uh, that, uh, that line uh, and that, that difference uh, is all about the intent, whether it's accidental or intentional, about, describes the risk and the scope of the incident. So let me describe it. Um, hazmat traditionally refers to an accidental release of a harmful substance. And that substance is not meant to be used as a weapon. So uh, for responders, the high, pr high priority is placed on the safety of both the personnel responding and the public. It tends to occur in smaller scale. So you think about uh, chemical spills uh, in uh, factories or gas leaks in an industrial uh, zone. And usually because uh, these events happen in uh, establishments that are already uh, doing or handling uh, this harmful or chemical or this harmful substances, then there's already prior knowledge of the potential hazards. When we talk about CBR and E event, uh, we usually refer to an event uh, where there's a deliberate use of CBR and E warfare agents. So I'll talk about, we talk about um, uh, chemicals used in warfare. So their intent is to incite terror and to cause harm to people or the environment. So for the rescue workers, there's an acceptance of a certain level of risk because of the nature of the incident. And a lot of times because the intent is to harm, the substance is unknown or unidentified. So uh, if you look at the incidents that uh, involve hazardous material, uh, uh, we will know, know that, there, that this line you know, between hazmat and accidental release and cbr &E, uh, with the uh, intent to harm, uh, sometimes it's blurred. And I'll show you why. So I'll give you cases and uh, let us describe the, these events. So for case number one, the date is September 6, 1987, location in the Philippines. Fatalities resulted when members of the Philippine Constabulary, that's the former name of the Philippine National Police, suffered from poisoning after accepting bags of ice water from an individual during a fun run. So the substance is unknown. Okay, so there's very little information on this incident, but we will need to think about uh, whether this was intentional, was their intent to harm this group of uh, 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 Philippine Constabulary, members of the Philippine Constabulary. The risk was directed no, to this uh, uh, members of the PC. And the scope involved a particular segment of uh, society. So let's talk about case number two. The date is March 11, 2011. The location is in Japan. So following a major earthquake, a tsunami disabled the power supply and the cooling system of three Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactors, causing high radioactive releases for the next few days. There were no deaths directly from uh, radiation sickness, but over a thousand deaths were uh, documented uh, at the evacuation site. So these were people who were suffering from medical conditions and they were unable to seek treatment. Um, uh, and those who suffered from trauma. Okay, so the substance involved here is a radioactive material. So is this intentional? Most likely not, because this is an effect of a natural event impacting on a man-made structure, which is the nuclear power plant. So the risk is, uh, involves uh, all no? the communities as well as responders, and it has a large, this is a large scale event. Okay, let's describe case number three. The date is September 2001, location in the USA. Letters were sent to two US senators and several media organizations. 
people who handle these letters started to get sick. So after investigation, it was uh, confirmed that these were cases of anthrax, uh, particularly a contagious anthrax, which occurred in 11 of the cases and inhalational anthrax in uh, another uh, 11 of the patients. There were five fatalities in this incident, uh, which uh, required the treatment of antibiotics for a wide range of uh, the population and uh, caused billions of damage, uh, billions in economic damage. Okay, so was this intentional? So from the investigation, yes, this was an, uh, an intentional. This was intentional. And the risk, uh, it was targeting particular uh, personalities. No? Uh, so the scope, it covered the large area. Um, several states were involved. Okay, let's have case number four. The date is April 2014, location in Mindanao. The National Epidemiologic Center received reports of human deaths that's allegedly due to horse meat poisoning. Investigations done showed nine deaths with signs and symptoms of CNS infection. So the investigation showed that the agent involved uh, is a biological agent of a Hennepa virus. Uh, and it was determined that the primary route of transmission was contact with contaminated body fluids. Also identified was the carrier. Uh, were, there were, uh, the carrier identified fruit bats and flying foxes. So there's another dimension to this case uh, because of a security threat. Viral samples can be used as bioweapon. And so areas of the investigation are also frequented by insurgents and bandits. So they needed uh, some form of security for the people uh, doing the investigation and doing the scientific work for this case. Okay, so was this intentional? We, we really don't know, not sure. Uh, there's a risk, there's a security risk. No? And uh, although this is uh, uh, happening in a portion of the country. Okay, and uh, this is near to our place, the case number five. The date is February 3, 2020, location in Abota City. So 500 families, mostly informal settlers, were exposed to a strong odor, causing coughing, nose, and throat irritation. So the substance identified the ammonia. So this was the incident mentioned earlier. Uh, so it was determined that there was an ammonia leak no, in an ice plant, uh, which uh, initially suffered a minor explosion causing the ammonia leak. So I'll go back to this case later. Right. So was this intentional? Uh, based on investigations, um, uh, it was determined that it was uh, an accident no, uh, from failure to, power, to follow uh, SOPs in the ice plant. So the risk is uh, high no, for both the communities uh, surrounding the ice plant and for the rescuers. And uh, the scope involved large communities uh, around the place. All right, so what is the government doing for uh, these cases? Uh, so there's uh, a national, what we call a national CBRN action plan. And Dr. Irma Makalian is part of this. And the goal is to reduce the threat of and damage from CBRN incidents of accidental, natural, and intentional origin, including terrorist acts. So as we can see, uh, the use of the CBRN term here involves um, incidents from accidental to uh, intentional, including terrorist acts. So what are the risk scenarios when we are dealing with CBRN agents? So we talk about natural hazards first, such as uh, diseases. So what we have now is a pandemic. Uh, and then we talk about natural hazards like earthquakes and floods, which may impact on uh, uh, man-made structures containing CBRN materials. Uh, and this is what happened in the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant after the earthquake. Then uh, the more common ones would be accidents, uh, such as industrial accidents. So we have gas leaks, chemical spills, laboratory accidents, as well as transportation accidents involving um, transportation vehicles carrying CBRN agents. And then there are the criminal CBRN hazards no, involving terrorism, sabotage, as well as illicit use or illicit trafficking of uh, CBRN agents. So what are the components of the response to CBR events? So there is a need to detect, identify, and monitor uh, these events, 
informa information management is very critical, uh, especially for us uh, as uh, healthcare providers and as responders, no? Uh, because we will not, uh, we will not, uh, we will, uh, there's the risk, no, that the, these responders will be exposed to the effects of the seabaring agents. So we need uh, the proper physical protection as well as hazard management and uh, for our for the healthcare workers, we need to uh, involve ourselves no, uh, in medical countermeasures, countermeasures and support. That, so specifically for the medical response components, it follows no, our emergency response uh, uh, activities. So it starts with uh, a bystander maybe or a factory worker, wherever it happens, identifying that there is a potential uh, exposure. No? Um, uh, if we take the case of the example earlier uh, during the question, community questions, um, the scenario was you are at a party and then you there's an odor and then suddenly a lot of the people in the room uh, started having difficulty in breathing. Okay, so um, somebody recognizes that there's a potential um, emergency there and uh, gets in touch with the authorities. So for the medical responders, we have the rescue and paramedical personnel uh, who are trained, no? have the proper training, background, and the proper protection no? and equipment. Uh, and they may need to do primary decontamination at the site if uh, decontamination is uh, a form of management for the particular agent involved. And then the, uh, the link between the pre-hospital personnel and the hospital personnel would be in the form of maybe a command center or a dispatch center, uh, which will link the efforts of the pre-hospital team to the hospital team uh, or the receiving hospital. So transportation is also important. Uh, so if you are transporting a patient from a hazmat or a CBR incident, then it would take a different form of uh, knowledge and skills uh, to transport, including the transportation vehicle. And then at the receiving hospital, if this is a hospital prepared to receive these types of patients, then they may be required to do secondary decontamination and provide acute management uh, in the emergency department and later on in the inpatient uh, areas. So what is the role of healthcare workers? One, we, uh, if we have the proper training, no, uh, we may need to assist first responders in managing exposed individuals at the site. So we can start the management of uh, patients exposed to CBRNA agents even at the site, uh, assuming we have the proper uh, training and skills and the proper system. And for the, those in the hospitals that are, have the training, uh, we will... Uh, they may be assigned to receive casualties from a CBR in the event. And the managed casualties, uh, of course, with the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment and with the necessary skills and resources. And then uh, for the tertiary or the specialty centers, then they could provide the required or the needed uh, specialty services such as poison centers, infection control services, trauma and uh, epi epidemiology section. So healthcare workers are at particular risk for CBR, CBRN threats no? when the hospital receives contaminated patients during mass casualty events. And that's why to protect employees, hospitals benefit from info uh, to help in their emergency planning. So how do we manage patients at the ED? So let me go back to the case I mentioned earlier, because this is the case that happened at the Philippine General Hospital. So uh, on February 3, 2020, and if you will remember, this was just the start of the pandemic. No, um, We were already received, the Philippine General uh, Hospital was already receiving uh, COVID suspects no? beginning from January of 2020. Uh, so we uh, received a message no, that uh, some patients will be brought to the emergency department. And this is a case of um, a community being exposed to a strong odor. And the most common complaints of the, those patients was, were coughing, as well as nose and throat irritation. So the substance identified was ammonia. So this was relayed to us by the poison, uh, poison center, by the National Poison Center of PGH. And the challenge was that we are already dealing with the uh, uh, COVID suspects uh, in this pandemic, and we had to prepare to receive a large number of patients 
exposed to this uh, to ammonia. So you can imagine the challenges no, uh, for the emergency department and for the entire hospital uh, and how to uh, triage and how to um, manage these patients uh, in the emergency department. Okay, so let me go back to some basic principles when we're dealing with uh, uh, CBRNA agents, in particular with uh, chemical agents. So we talk of routes of exposure. Uh, there was a question earlier. So um, the routes of exposure include inhalational, transdermal, and transmucosal absorption, ingestion, and injection subcutaneously, intramuscularly, or intravenously. So remember, the routes of exposure are not mutually exclusive. So some agents uh, would, uh, uh, so some exposures no, would involve inhalational as well as transdermal and so on. So for the question earlier, uh, do I answer the question? <laughs> All right, so the question earlier posted was, uh, what is the most common route of exposure of hazmat incidents? And uh, so the answer is inhalational. All right, so when we receive information in the emergency department no, that uh, uh, patients will be brought to the ED, so we need to verify the information. We need to get the important uh, details such as who are involved, what is involved, no, if it uh, has been identified, the location of this event, uh, when it happened, and the why and the how. No? So this is very basic, even uh, for the more common emergencies that we encounter. Uh, so just to show you in the pre-hospital setting, um, this may be uh, required no, uh, to manage the exposed um, uh, community. So there's the need to establish a hot zone. So the hot zone refers to the site of the exposure. Now, if we're talking of, a, for example, a chemical exposure. So this is off limits to everybody except those who are trained to respond and to treat patients at the site. Okay, so that's the hot zone. Then the next uh, area established is the warm zone. So this is where the decontamination area is placed. No? So this is what we call the decontamination corridor. So patients who are exposed to a particular, uh, for example, chemical agent uh, that needs to be uh, removed from the site will undergo decontamination in this area. And then they are now brought once uh, after decontamination, they're brought to the cold zone. And this uh, cold zone is where you have our emergency medical services. Okay, so, so this is the general setup when we are dealing with um, hazardous agents. Right, so for the medical management of hazmat patients, uh, one common treatment would be decontamination. Uh, exposure solely to gas gases usually requires no skin or mucous membrane decontamination, but exposure to irritant or corrosive gases are treated with copious or is treated with copious tepid water irrigation. Uh, exposed symptomatic eyes should be continuously irrigated with lactated with water or LR solution or normal saline throughout the patient contact and during transport. So I'm just giving you an overview of uh, medical management. Okay, so for the quiz break, this is the second question posted earlier. For exposure to solids or liquids, rapid removal, removal of clothing is the single most important step in decontamination. And it removes 80 to 90% of contaminants. Right, so after the initial assessment, we do the primary survey and resuscitation. This, is, this, is, this can be done at the site and also done at the emergency department once the patients are received. So in general, for patients with liquid or solid chemical contamination, the primary patient assessment and resuscitation are performed only after any necessary skin decontamination in the warm zone. So this is done to avoid contaminating uh, the personnel no? or other people. So the only procedures and to, of course, to minimize the effects of the chemical agent. The only procedures performed before any needed skin decontamination are Opening and maintaining the airway open with spinal motion restriction as needed, needle decompression of attention pneumothorax, and control of exsanguinating external hemorrhage. So these are life-saving measures. So and they can be done and they should be done before any uh, start of the decontamination with uh, the proper uh, personal protective for those who will uh, respond. Okay, as well as IM injection of nerve agents. 
All right, so for uh, continuation from the primary survey, we go through the uh, assessment using AMPLE. So for those who are uh, doing uh, emergency work, you may be familiar with this one. This is a quick way to get the necessary information from patients. So we also do this for our hazmat patients. So getting the allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal or other intakes and events leading to the presentation. And it should nor occur concurrently with any necessary decontamination and or during primary survey resuscitation. Right. So for secondary survey, this is the time now that we identify poisoning complications, recognize pre-existent problems with potential for exacerbation, assess for accompanying trauma or burns, and recognize toxic syndrome. So I'll give you a... a uh, review now of the toxidromes. This is uh, what we usually encounter. All right, so the patient presents with irritation, uh, inflammation, mucous membranes, edema, uh, and you know, chemical burns of the exposed mucous membranes, airways, and the lungs. So examples of chemicals that would produce these signs and symptoms would include ammonia, as in the case of our ammonia leak uh, mass casualty incident, chlorine, methyl isocyanate, and phosgene. So what do you think is this toxidrome? What do we call this toxidrome? Is it asphyxiant, cholinergic, corrosive, hydrocarbon and substituted hydrocarbon, or irritant gas syndrome? So you can put it in the chat, your answers in the chat box. Okay. Okay, so answer D. Okay, so let me show you. Okay, so this is an example of a. Okay, an irrit uh, uh, this is an irritant gas toxidrome. All right, next. So this uh, condition is caused by inadequate supply to the lungs, decreased oxygen delivery via the blood, and or decreased oxygen extraction by the tissues. So symptoms include dyspnea. Shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, dysrhythmias, syncope, seizures, coma, and death. Okay, examples no, that will uh, give us this toxidrome. Okay, carbon dioxide, okay, carbon monoxide, cyanides, sulfides, azides. It's very technical. Okay, so what is this toxidrome? Asphyxiant, cholinergic, corrosive, hydrocarbon, substitute hydrocarbon, or irritant gas. Okay, masagot. Okay, so I can't view the answers, but anyway. Okay, AAA, very good. Okay, all right. So this is what we call okay, an asphyxiant syndrome. Very good. Okay, next. Okay, sorry. So ito yung ating mnemonics, na. No? Yung dumbbells and the empty WHF. Okay. So I know you know this. So examples of this uh, would be organophosphates, carbamates. Okay. So what is this? Uh, toxidrome. This is. Okay, ito yung ating tiyatawag na cholinergic toxidrome. Okay, that next is characterized by irritant and corrosive local toxic effects. And it can show up as chemical burns of the skin and mucous membranes. Examples would be acids, bases, oxidizers, and white phosphorus. So what is this toxidrome? Parang ando na yung term, no? Okay, so this is the corrosive toxidrome. Okay, characterized by sleepiness, narcosis, cardiac irritability, okay. causing dysarrhythmias, VTAC, VFib. Examples are propane, gasoline, toluene, and the rest. Okay, so what is this toxidrome? Okay, so this is uh, due to hydrocarbon and substituted hydrocarbon. 
All right. So for poisoning, uh, we have what we call the this treatment paradigm. No? Um, for those who have taken up to, um, courses in toxicology, this is the and for those in emergency uh, medicine. No? So this is our basic uh, treatment paradigm. So we start with the, the we have the EBCDs. No? So this is what we want to do: alter absorption, administer antidote. Okay, the basics of uh, response, change catabolism, distribute differently, and enhance uh, elimination of the agent or the poison. Okay, so um, for this uh, CBRNE incidence, it is important that hospitals are prepared. And uh, if we have a proper system of dealing with these uh, events, then we... Uh, maybe identify hospitals that have the capability to respond and serve as uh, receiving hospitals for uh, patients exposed to CBR and uh, incidents. Uh, so part of the response would include, of course, uh, getting the proper uh, equipment uh, and uh, supplies to manage these cases, as well as proper training for the personnel, uh, including a proper uh, PPE, and then there is a need to for collaboration and coordination with the other agencies involved in CBR and response, such as the uh, our uh, first responders, and that includes our uh, BFP, Peer Fire Protection, the PNP, and uh, maybe also the military. Uh, so these uh, agencies have their own CBR and um, units, no? um, And uh, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Macalino earlier. Uh, what is lacking in right now, no, in terms of developing our capability to manage CBRN cases, are the uh, training for the medical personnel, no. So, medyo tayo yung nahuhule, no, because uh, if we have trained pre-hospital care personnel to take uh, to uh, take care of the patients in the pre-hospital setting, no, right after an incident, pagdating naman nila sa hospital ay medyo kulang tayo, no, sa preparation, kulang tayo sa kaalaman in managing these cases. Then, um, sayang yung ating effort, no. So what is needed is uh, a full uh, response, no, uh, from the side, from the pre-hospital setting to the hospital setting. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll turn you over to our host. Salamat po. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. April Yaneta with a comprehensive presentation. I think some of you really enjoyed the, the quiz, no? Tsaka tamang mga sagot nila, April, parang ano, iba pa sagsabi, favorite daw nila yan. So I wow. hope you learned a lot, and uh, we like to thank you so much, April, for that. That, that comprehensive presentation it was really very good. Okay, I'm going to turn over to Raymond. Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. April Yaneta. So that was really, uh, well, I opening po para sa akin. I don't really have that much exposure with regards to uh, CBRN. So anything that's uh, in relation to that, uh, something of a refresher course, because uh, a lot of these really, especially when, when you're talking about uh, giving examples, how to manage hazardous program contamination, etc. Very, very theoretical po, uh, at least in my experience po. Anyway, our next speaker naman po, uh, someone who is also very, very knowledgeable, uh, comes very well indoors on this topic. He is a nurse 3 at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine at the Philippine General Hospital and has received significant training for CBRNE. Uh, please welcome to your screens, uh, Nurse John Bernard Bernardo. Sir John? Hi, good day to everyone. Uh... Let me just share my uh, slides. Uh, okay. I think you're on your last slide, Sir John. So. <laughs> yeah. Ayun, okay. There we go. If you could, okay, see. And then go to, there we go. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi, um, good day to everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate the organizers of this uh, webinar series for a very successful 93rd web webinar series. 
And I would like to thank the organizers and my mentors, my team leaders for inviting me here to share this experience uh, in CBRN. Uh, actually, this is uh, emerging, I think, emerging specialization in uh, nursing. So I'm going to discuss my CBRN experience, uh, in particular here in uh, UPPGH. So the UPPGH CBRN team. So the team is composed of uh, physicians, uh, nurses, EMTs, security personnel, and safety officers. So um, the area of practice, um, actually, we have divided the, the specialization. If ever uh, we've encountered uh, a chemical uh, incident, uh, most probably the primary uh, service that will handle the patient would be the uh, toxicology medicine. So for the biological, um, the IDS or the infectious disease and the general medicine, for the radiological and nuclear, probably the, the most, uh, uh, the nuclear medicine. So um, going to trainings, um, actually, uh, this is my uh, training course uh, since I'm not uh, a physician. So uh, I'm a nurse. Uh, actually, I've been working as a uh, mental health and psychiatric nurse. I started. Um, uh, I want. I want to be a, a counselor and addiction counselor. So that I got fascinated in clinical toxicology, and then that's the start of my career in CDRN. So I went to basic training course in nurse toxicology by the UPTGH Division of Nursing Education and Training, and then after that, uh, I went on a postgraduate course in clinical occupational and hazardous material toxicology. Uh, that's uh, to my training here, uh, also from the UTPGH uh, Division of Nursing Education and Training. And then uh, the Medical Management of CBRN Casualty Workshop from the United States uh, uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The next, the Weapons of Mass Destruction Operation course, also from DITRA. Weapons of Mass Destruction Instructor Development course from DITRA also, and then the Maintenance Management Course and Equipment Training for CBRN. So um, when we talk about the CBRN, we also talk about the equipments and the detectors. Actually, that's our first line in assessing the, the, the situation. So we need the, the equipments. So I, I'm uh, lucky to uh, undergo uh, training for the equipments. Uh, these equipments are um, state-of-the-art, Actually, uh, ito yung mga equipments na ginagamit din sa ibang bansa up to this point. So, uh, napagkaluban tayo na, ng mga ganitong equipment and uh, yun, maswerte ako na isa ako doon sa napasama doon sa training na yun. So, here are some of the equipments that we use in CDRNE. Oh, by the way, oh, training pala muna. Ayan. Ito yung uh, Team 1 ng UPPGH CDRN response. Yeah, some of the equipments uh, slash PPE used in CBRNE. Yung first na makikita nyo sa left is the Q-ray. This is a multi-gas uh, detector. It can uh, uh, ginagamit siya for assessment ng uh, types ng gas for oxygen, carbons, and also the LELs. Lalabas yung me measurement na yan. Uh, i point mo lang yan doon sa area na um, pinagdududahan nyo na merong um, poisonous gas and then i-detect niya kung anong meron doon sa gas na uh, doon sa particular area na yon. Actually, hindi mo kailangan pumasok. Meron siyang tube na nilalagay dyan sa ibabaw na pa para siyang mahabang wand na pwede mong i-insert lang uh, especially kapag uh, during in tactical tactical operations or tactical missions, pwede, pwede mo siya, yung tube na yan, pwede mo lang siya idaan dun sa ilalim ng, ng pinto and madedetect niya kung ano yung uh, gases na meron dun sa loob na uh, room na yun, in particular room na yun. Next is the rad eye, the B20ER. Uh, this is a um, uh, detector that can detect uh, gamma, alpha, beta, and x-rays for radiations. So, yung kung makikita niyo sa 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 palabas yung parang malaking plant na ginagamit nila for 
detection ng radiations. Yan, ganyan na lang siya kalaki. Para lang siya si laki ng cellphone na medyo mataba. And then, if ever, pwede rin siyang gamitin dosimeter. So, if ever, during operations or missions, um, pwede mo siyang ilagay sa ano, uh, you can wear this uh, detector. Pwede siyang isabit sa, sa PPE mo. And then, you can set an alarm. Yung, ano na yan, yung, yung equipment na yan. Next, is the LCD3 or JCAD. LCD3 for uh, industrial type, uh, JCAD for um, tactical type na, na uh, when I say tactical, yun yung mga ginagamit ng uh, military, ganyan, military personnel, security personnel. So, pero actually parehas lang yun, JCAD and then the LCD3. So, chemical detector din yan. Uh, it can detect nerve, uh, nerve agents and uh, corrosive agents. So, ganun lang din siya. I padadaanin mo lang din siya doon sa ano, padadaanin mo lang din siya doon sa, sa room na yun. Uh, tapos, meron siyang seed pack or parang parang uh, filter sa ilalim. Tapos, yun yung mag-a-analyze kung anong type ng chemical agent yung nandoon. But actually, during my training, um, some of the uh, parang first batch na pinapapunta ng mga head of states, uh, they carry this type of detector yang ano na yan, yung uh, LCD3 or JCAD. So, to assess the situation at saka yung area kung safe ba yun para puntahan ng head of state. The LCD3. Um, next, for the PT. Actually, ayun, going back, marami pong mga uh, detectors na meron like in the Gemini. Yung Gemini din. Um, kaso wala, hindi ko siya na-picturean eh, during my training. Pero yun, yung Gemini na yun can detect tsaka assess yung, yung substance. Um, let's say powder man siya or liquid man siya tapos uh, anuhan na siya ng infrared. Kaya niyang basahin yung component nung ano na yun. Nung, nung, nung substance na yun. Actually, nung time ng tinitest namin yun, yung ginamit namin yung 3-in-1 na coffee. So, nakita niya yung ano, yung dairy product dun sa substance na yun. Yung Gemini ano na yun, na detector. Okay, so let's talk about the PPE naman. Um, according to NIOSH, mayroon yung, yung, yung levels of PPE na ginagamit. Uh, yung level, level A, le, uh, level B, tsaka yung level C na type ng, ng PPE. Well, actually, mayroon yung level D, yung helmet, tsaka yung ordinary na personal protective equipment na ginagamit sa, sa work or sa construction. Yung makikita nyo yung level D. So, ito, sa picture na to, makikita nyo yung level C na PPE. Yan. So, kung titingnan nyo, well, lahat naman tayo ata nag, na, na, uh, nagpa-practice sa hospital and nakita ko nga doon sa isang question kung yung level 4 ba na PPE can, can be used in uh, uh, hazmat incident. Well, for me, in my opinion, um, pwede, pero the, the, ang problem lang doon is yung duration, yung time at saka yung permeability nung, nung, nung barrier mo. Kasi yun, parang manipis yun eh. Ito, yung, yung material na ito, yung overall na yan, as in mat, makapal siya, para siyang uh, tarp na meron pang multiple layers na parang laminate sa ibabaw. So, yan, uh, tatagal yan, especially sa mga corrosive na, na agents, hindi, yan, hindi siya agad-agad na magpapasyo dun sa, sa, sa skin mo or papasok dun sa skin mo. First deal, Meron pa rin yan limitation. And this one, uh, yeah, actually, during my training yan with the DITRA, uh, I was donning a level A PPE. And uh, yan, yan na sa likod na yan sa uh, SCBA or self-contained breathing apparatus. So the difference between a level C and a level A, yung type ng coverall, and then the breathing uh, mechanism. Sa uh, level C kasi, yung air na nang gagaling, galing sa labas, filtered siya. Ito, yung air sa, sa level A, yung air na pinanggagalingan na hinihinga mo, galing siya, contained siya, self-contained yung air na hinihinga mo. So, manggagaling siya doon sa tanke, sa likod. So, kadalasan niya yung tank na yan, naglalas ng mga 60 minutes, uh, depende sa size nung, nung, nung tank. Pero, during my training, syempre, in... Uh, in an incident na yun, paggamit ka ng level A, syempre hindi mo i-max out yung 16 minutes na na breathing time mo dun sa sa tank na yan. So kadalasan 
ang sinasabi nila, 30 minutes lang yan yung, yung, ano, yung mission duration ng level A kasi kailangan mo mag-alap ng 15 minutes going in dun sa hot zone and 15 minutes going out dun sa, sa hot zone. So, mas mabuti pa na meron kang uh, maiiwan na panghinga kesa maubusan ka doon sa loob mismo ng hot zone. And kapag ka nakasuot ka ng level A uh, na PPE, sobrang mainit. Like, you wouldn't last a minute inside the level A PPE. Ito yun, itsura nun. Yan. Um, yan yung safest na PPE, uh, level A, self-contained siya. And siya may pinakamata, makapal na, ano, na, na protection, level of protection pagdating sa coverall. Encapsulated ka sa loob. So unlike sa 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 PPE sa level C na ano naka yung edges noon. Ito encapsulated, fully encapsulated ka diyan. As in sobrang init niyan, uh, I'm wearing a cooling vest. Yung cooling vest alone uh, parang nasa 5 kilograms na yon. And then the SCBA is like uh, 20 kilograms. So hindi lahat um, kaya na mag 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 don ng ng level A PPE. So uh, chine-check talaga yung vitals at saka yung, yung health ng individual na would go sa, sa hot zone, especially if you're going to don uh, level A PPE. So, dito, yan, makikita nyo na yung cooling vest. Cooling vest, yan yung nasa katawang ko. So, para siyang silica gel na nakababad sa, sa nakalagay sa ref. Tapos, kapag sinuot mo siya sa yung, yung level A, Um, yung malamig lang yung katawan mo actually, pero sa legs mo as in sobrang papawisan ka na mag-pull talaga yung, yung pawis mo sa, sa boots at saka sa, sa sleeves ng, ng level A na PPE mo. And ito, isa sa mga trainings na ito, well, nung nag-conduct din kami ng training sa, sa Armed Forces, um, sa Armed Forces, pinapag-jogging sila na naka-level B na PPE. Ito, pinatakbo rin ako dito at saka pinag-jumping jack ako dyan na naka-level A. And Medyo mahirap. Mahirap siya. So, kailangan, ano ka, uh, fit to wear that uh, level of PPE. Hindi lahat kaya mag, uh, mag-don ng level ATP. So, isa, isa yun sa mga limitations ng PPE na yan. Now, this is the uh, MCD tent. Uh, it's a mass casualty decontamination tent. Uh, yun yung current or yung newest na MCD tent na ginagamit. Uh, even the US and the Europe, European countries, they use this Uh, tent. It's a four-lane tent, pero in this setup, we have set it up uh, in a three-lane tent with non-ambulatory lane. Pero kasi kapag ginawa itong ano, uh, four-lane tent, lahat yan, puro pang ambulatory na. Yung tent na yan, uh, it's capable of decontaminating uh, individuals. Meron niyang sariling water supply. Meron niyang sariling electrical supply at saka meron niyang sariling air circulat, uh, circulation supply. So kahit na ano yan, all weather tent yan, kahit na nasa snow or kahit na nasa disyerto ka, magpa-function yang 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 tent na yan. Tapos <clears throat> yung tent na syempre, kapag ka nag-decon ka, yung yung waste na yung tubig na tatapon sa ilalim, meron niyang sariling waste disposal uh, carrier. So hindi niya ikakalat yung ano yung yung tubig or yung contaminated water na you have used for uh, decontamination. Meron siyang sariling bladder na tinatawag. So yan. Imagine kapag halimbata ang haling tapat tapos naka level 8 ka na na PPE. Uh, actually during our drills, eto naka level C lang kami na na PPE. Sobrang init na as in meron pa kang isang uh, uh, teammate kami diyan na nag-heat stroke ata yun. So, yun, part noon na uh, during ingress and egress ng, ano, ng, ng responder, kinukunan talaga ng vital signs. Pre and post. Uh, uh, decon. So, kukunan sila ng vital signs talaga. So, kailangan physically fit yung individual na uh, magiging responder dito sa, ano, sa, sa CDRM. So, yan, nung ina-assemble namin or tinatayo namin yung tent na yan. Um, yun, sabi nung trainers namin uh, from DITRA, yun nga, uh, parang yung record nila na may tayo yan ay 15 minutes. Uh, kami tinayo namin yan ng, I think, 16 minutes ata yun. 16 minutes namin na naitayo yung uh, fully operational na decontent. Now, going 
sa experience. Uh, I would like to share my experience. Kung saan uh, yung yung recent recent experience sa na na activate yung CBRN ng uh, UPPGH. So it's the ammonia leak incident, uh, February 5. Ah, uh, ito na yung kasagsagan din ng ano, kasagsagan na to ng ng COVID. So, yun. Um na activate yung CBRN response team dito. So, ayan, as you can see sa kabila, uh, yung first picture, that's the command post. Actually, that's the that's also the office of uh, the call room of the National Poison Management and Control. So, sila yung naging parang command post noon. And then at your right side, yun yung uh, situation ng ER namin. Pero konti pa yan ng time na yan. Pero napuno yung ano namin dyan. Yung ED namin. Tapos, uh, ano pa lang yun? Sa ammonia incident pa lang yun. Hindi pa kasama yung sa COVID cases. So, ang struggle doon kasi uh, meron kang pandemic na airborne yung ano, yung yung transmissibility ng yung, yung, yung sakit. Tapos meron kang um, as casualty incident na na um, ammonia leak. So, yun. Pero dito, uh, hinandle namin. Just an overview kung paano namin na-handle. So, yung manpower resources, we use the three-color triaging system. So, sa red, uh, one them team leader, uh, two them resident, uh, isang uh, physician on duty, one neuro resident, one ORL resident, upper resident, toxicology fellow, one pedia senior, and then a family medicine resident, and then one nurse. So, um, yun lang yung kagandahan dito na kapag ka during nung, ano, nung uh, ammonia incident namin, uh, yun, na yung ibang services ng department namin, um, ano rin, uh, kumbaga nag-activate din, and then tumulong din talaga sa ER. Kasi as in sobrang traffic na nun, yung, yung ambulance, yung ingress at saka egress ng ambulance namin, uh, nag-start na mag-pile up dun sa, sa kalsada, sa papunta sa ER namin nun, nung time na yun. So, buti na lang, medyo naka, napaghandaan namin nung, nung time na bago pa dumating yung, ano, yung influx ng mga uh, pasyente. So, the yellow, yan, one them, ganun din, one pod, one toxicology fellow, one pedia resident, one famed resident, and then one nurse. Sa green, one them team leader, two them resident, one pod, one pedia resident, one famed, one nurse. Uh, ako yun. Ako yung nurse na in charge doon sa, sa green na, ano, na area. So, yun, during that incident, we have established a unified command system, the incident command system namin. And then si Dr. April Yaneta, yung kanina yung speaker natin, was the incident commander. Uh, during that time, she was the chair of the ED. So, yeah, ni liaison officer, si TD uh, Strada. Meron kami safety officer, uh, an ER nurse, si Kerwin Garcia. Um, siya in charge tuun sa pag-clear ng beds to accommodate yung uh, influx ng mga patients. At saka kung saan ilalagay yung mga pasyente. Uh, public information, si Dr. Jonas Del Rosario. Uh, planning, si Captain Ares. Operation, si Carol Sikat. Logistics, si Dr. Uh, Romer Tanghal. Finance, Office of the Director. So, ito, yung triaging, triaging system namin. The green, green delay. Just to give you an overview of the triaging uh, system that, that we use. I think um, uh, you're all familiar with this. So, sa green, yung asymptomatic patients with reliable historian, um, patients with minor sensations of burning, nose, throat, eyes, and respiratory tract, slight cough, and rhinorrhea. Uh, green, sa medical personnel, na feels that, uh, if the medical personnel feels that the patient has been exposed to a significant amount of ammonia. So, sa yellow, may persistent cough, a burning or irritating of the eyes, dizziness, headaches, and then red, drowsiness, changes in sensorium, chest pains, and dizziness. Ah, uh, ito yung ano, uh, naging floor plan ng ED namin during that time. So, yan makikita niyo halos sinakop niya yung dalawang ano, dalawang ward because of the pandemic also. And then yung MCI yung MCI na ammonia leak na incident din. So, medyo ano talaga, uh, medyo mabigat ng time na yon. Well, yun um, yun yung nangyari experiences. Actually, 
Uh, I also want to talk about the the struggles during that time. Yung dun sa ano, sa experiences in the during the ammonia incident. Uh, nung time na na activate na yung CBRN response team. Ang naging problem namin noon uh, that time was how to uh, deploy the MCD tent. Kasi nung time na yon nung gabi parang uh, yung may mga nakapark na na hot sa gilid. So yon bigla ang ano lang then decision call na pag-decision na namin na ang establish namin yung emergency beacon. So, nakapag-establish kami ng two emergency beacons dun sa uh, EMS. So, lahat ng papasok, well, I think ano, nang, ang, ano naman din namin ay secondary beacon kami. So, lahat ng pumasok, dumaan din muna dun sa e-beacon namin and then bago pumasok dun sa sa e namin na assigned for the MCI. So, that's all. Um, I hope na yun, na showcase ko yung uh, CBRN experience ko, my trainings, and sana may interest, uh, ma magi interesado kayo dun sa ano, sa sa CBRN. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Uh, I think that was a very, very, very interesting presentation with all the pictures and very practical, and really shows us how. Complex this is, no, Raymond. No, parang nako parang walk in the park yung COVID, no, compared to, <laughs> to the preparations you have to you have to do for this. But anyway, thank you so much, John. I think that was really very very uh, informative, and I'm sure our audience really appreciates it also. Okay, Raymond. Uh, what are we doing next? Okay, parang nawawala ako ngayon sa sequence. All right, so we're going to have our Q&A session and then we're going to ask um, our guests to please open their videos. So, uh, Doc Ted, Doc Irma, April, and John, please open your videos. But while we're doing that, um, Raymond's going to cue our public service announcement. Go ahead, Raymond. Okay, thank you, Sir John, and thank you, Dr. Susie. Before we go into our Q&A session, uh, we'll just take a very quick break for our special public service announcement today. Uh, it's very a new set of ano po, no? It's part of our new set of videos uh, produced by the team. Take it away. Hi, Ate. Gusto ko nang lumabas at makipaglaro. Eh, di ba magkakasakit daw tayo kapag lumabas? Magpiface mask naman ako eh. Kahit na. Hanggat wala daw tayong injection, hindi tayo pwedeng lumabas at maglaro. Ano ba yan? Takot pa naman ako sa injection. Huwag ka magalala. Parang kagat lang daw ng langgam yun. Talaga? Eh, natatakot pa rin ako. E di sabay na lang tayo. Pa-injection? Oo, syempre. Loves kita eh. Para makapaglaro na tayo. Dahil mahal ko kayo, magpapabakuna ako. Ay, mga bata, magpapakuna na kayo. Stay safe and stay well. Mga bata, magpasama na sa Bakuna Center. Thank you so much, uh, TVUP. So the, the COVID communication public service announcement is one of the many creative outputs of the Stop COVID Deaths team to push for pediatric vaccination for children uh, five years and up. Uh, this is something that uh, we prepared uh, very recently, we hope this is something that you could also share uh, with your colleagues, uh, family members, and your friends uh, for us to be able to be protected against COVID-19. Dr. Susie? Okay, so um, Raymond, we'll start looking at the questions in the Q&A, and I saw some very interesting questions and in the chat box. But uh, to start our discussion, I wanted to ask um, maybe Ted and Irma. Uh, although we don't like to speculate on this webinar, no, we, we like to base our discussions on, on facts. We do know that because of the war in, in Russia, in, in Ukraine, and constant talking about chemical, uh, you know, chemical use of chemical weapons, and knowing that we have many Filipinos uh, in that part of Europe, what, what do you think? Okay, so speculation, it doing what if, eh, diba? What 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 would be likely agents that could be used in in the current context that we should prioritize? Kasi marami, di ba? Pero ano kaya yung ano ano kaya yung dapat pinag-aaralan natin ng mas maiging ngayon, whether chemical, biological, or whatever. 
Sige, we'll ask Ted first. Ted, yeah, muna. Yeah, that's Steve. a very good question. And I've been monitoring, like everyone else, I've been monitoring this Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. And uh, one of the first things that uh, came out was really the accusation of each other of use of uh, these types of weapons. The, the Russians were accusing the Ukrainians that they have biological labs uh, funded by the U.S. to create uh, biological weapons. Uh, so... So there's already that uh, problem. And then the, the visual pictures of cluster bombs being used, the type of explosive that's actually been banned because of the amount of damage to civilians in a conflict. And then, of course, nuclear. Uh, I mean, Putin himself warned that he, he has nuclear bombs. <laughs> he even stated that as a fact in one of his speaking engagements. So the threat is actually there. And it's, it's actually very, very real. Uh, and like, like, for example, what happened with this pandemic? For many years, the WHO had been warning us, you prepare for a pandemic, let's prepare a pandemic preparedness plan. And when it comes, after all the preparation, you actually see there are still a lot more things you actually need to do. And uh, uh, that, that's, I think, where we are right now when Susie talks about chemical, biological, and uh, nuclear, and uh, all these types of explosives. We're there at this point wherein we need to educate everyone from our first responders to our emergency department doctors, to our laboratory technicians, our, our uh, radiologists to really understand and help each other. So it takes a whole village to actually really create this, just like uh, any type of natural disaster. My field has been natural disasters, but obviously the principles are the same. These mm -hmm. agents, these biological weapons can create so much and uh, April talked about local experiences, but there has been many. I mean, Iraq Iraq was accused of using chemical weapons in uh, that northern part of Iraq prior to, to, to subdue uh, dissidents. And then uh, Syria also yeah. uh, used uh, chemical weapons recently. So mukang hindi effective yung what we call the uh, chemical weapons and uh, biologic weapons conventions, which have been signed by many of the UN nations. Uh, you know, even even our nuclear, but they were supposed to be na nuclear non-proliferation. But it looks like uh, kahapon lang eh, nag uh, test na naman si uh, Kim Jong Un of another uh, intercontinental ballistic missile launch. So, so the threats are there. Uh, our our problem is us ourselves. People used to talk to me and say, oh, "Don't study region nuclear. That won't happen to us." Did you know that all the reactors of Taiwan are actually in the north, in the southern part of the Taiwan island? That means if they had a fallout or if rush of China attacks, say Taiwan, and explodes some of those, affected the northern part of Luzon. I don't know how big, because uh, probably it's even bigger. So the key really is uh, commu uh, education and risk communication. I think what's being clear now with the messages of our speakers is that risk communication is very important to understand the risk. And to understand that this requires lots of logistics, exactly the same problem when we had the, the start of the pandemic. We were sending our samples to identify the disease to Australia, to, to, to Australia and to other countries. And then we had to start off fighting an illness by building molecular labs. We had only three and we had to build 200 plus. So can you imagine that? So we need to actually look at uh, all those devices that was shown by our speaker. Do, do we have enough of those devices to identify uh, chemical agents and uh, understand what our problem is? So, And then do we have trained people? Right now, we have uh, CBN RNE teams in PGH, in the Bureau of Fire, and the Armed Forces. But we always joke, after our first set of PPEs, wala na kami gagamitin. <laughs> so, so technically, di ba parang replay lang ng ating uh, COVID-19, di ba? And then we had to find and source PPE. So, so I think the key really is to stockpile all of this. Uh, prior to the start of this conference, Irma was talking about uh, antidotes. And we can't even stockpile antidotes because of the procurement system. Makokowa kami kasi may expire kami ng antidotes. Yeah. But uh, it's something that would be life-saving. So something that needs to be uh, uh, corrected as well. So very important to educate not only the doctors, pala, pati pala legislators and pati pala COA. Dapat ma-educate natin about CBR. So I'll stop there thank, and uh, give the yeah, floor. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Ted. Um, we'll go to Irma in a moment, but I just wanted to share no, na 
I think two years ago, again, when North Korea was testing its um, uh, missiles, um, merong pumasok sa airspace ng Japan. And um, so their sirens went off. No, they're prepared for this. Eh. Their sirens went off and children actually have a drill. They know what they're going to do. So they, they have a towel, which is wet. They are supposed to put that over their head. They have this like foil, parang foil covering, and they know that they have to keep their arms close to the body and they're supposed to duck. So kumbaga tayo nagtitraining for earthquake, sila sa level ng mga bata, meron silang drill for yeah. a nuclear fallout. So yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that um, yeah. because I went to Israel right after the first Oy, nawala ka, Ted. Ulit, Ted, nag-freeze ka. Go ahead. Raymond, nawala ba si Ted? I think he's still frozen, Dr. Susie, because of the UP. Okay. I think it's we'll, an internet connection. Okay. Yeah. okay, we'll get back to, to Ted. But we're going to ask Irma uh, a little bit about the threat. The threat from the war in Europe is what, what should we be focusing on? What should we be studying more? Irma, go ahead. So first I have to say this line that this follows the principle of no attribution because it's hard because I work with the CBRN national team of the sure. Anti-Terrorism Council. And so what I might say might be taken, you know, misconstrued. But just for the purpose of what has happened over the years. So in the issue of the Chemical Weapons Convention, People are looking at the experience of Syria right now, the use of a VX in Kuala Lumpur, uh, the use of, again, Novichok, which is a nerve agent similar to the original Soman, Sarin, Tabun, and VX. So it's there. The threat for the use of chemical weapons is really very real. So that's one of the areas because we know that, of course, the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, requested the countries who had stockpiled uh, during World War One and World War Two these chemical agents, but some of them probably have not completely destroyed what they promised to destroy. So there is really that possibility that the stockpiles for these old chemical warfare agents do exist. So again, if we talk about what priorities do we really need to understand, I think the chemical weapons threat is one of the most real threats because at least... Um, it is not going to uh, cause harm in the magnitude, perhaps, of a radionuclear fallout. That in the end, you, you don't want you don't want that kind of an event because it is going to affect not only the area of Ukraine but other areas in Europe as well. But again, uh, what we need to understand when we talk about radionuclear, the use of radionuclear material. So if you have a radiological material in a hospital like PGH that probably uses strontium-90, those are types of uh, radiological materials which we need to safeguard because somebody can break in and steal them. So that's where the, it, it's very important that our hospital also institutes a lot of security measures where these materials are. Why? Because this has been used in uh, improvised explosive devices. So you have a, a chemical that's really with a therapeutic use, but at the same time, it can be misused by people and interested parties. So again, when we talk about radionuclear, we have to understand what kind of particle is actually in the fallout. So depending on what material it is. So we, we have what we call the alpha particle, the beta, the gamma, and so on. And of course, the more... Uh, the alpha particle that probably is the one that they are shielding uses using the aluminum foil, but uh, it might not be enough to shield yourself with a beta emitter and a gamma emitter. So it all depends on the type of radiological material. So these are the things that we really need to watch out for. And when we talk about Soman, Sarin, and Sarin has been used. And the other one that we need to consider is the use of the blister agent or the vesicant agent like mustard agents. Hindi po ito yung mustard agent na mustard na nilalagay natin sa hot dog or hamburger. So it's a must it's called mustard agent but it has nothing to do with the sauce. <laughs> but yeah. uh, this is very difficult because as I've said um, you might not even know that a mustard agent has already been uh, deployed or weaponized. 
because it might take 24 hours to 48 hours before you see the full effect. And so you will have people coming into the emergency room presenting with sore eyes and a lot, some redness of the skin. And they might think that they just had a sunburn because they exposed themselves to the sun not knowing that uh, it has happened. But one last thing I want to point out now is the delivery system, the threat associated with the use of drones. We have to be careful because the drones are very good delivery systems. They can fly over our, you know, a certain airspace. You might think that this is just a toy, but it is the delivery system that can be used to push these agents, uh, yeah. you know, spray the people with VX or whatever uh, uh, toxicant people would, might use. Thank you, Irma. Uh, Ted, before you you froze, you were you were in the middle of saying something. So, would you like yeah. to finish? So you're yeah. talking about the children in Japan being taught what yeah. to do. So I was there in Israel after the uh, uh, first Gulf War with uh, Father Bush. And uh, the children were all taught to carry their gas masks, their face masks. And then when the siren goes off, everybody starts to wear it, wear it properly. So even kids walking to school knew how to wear a mask. And the interesting thing was that uh, they showed me the underbelly of the hospital. And in the yeah. underbelly of the hospital, there was an airlock against a nuclear attack. So it's probably the safest hospital I've seen where in the Kim Sheba Medical Center had an underground that used as a minor surgery and OPD. And then the boss shows me that the whole thing can take in about uh, 500 beds of injured. Yeah. And it's also where all the doctors will go if an atomic bomb or a nuclear attack was staged in Tel Aviv. And they would all go there. It's got an airlock and food and water to supply them for six months. So can you imagine the amount of preparation? Another place I saw this kind of bunker was in Switzerland, a neutral country who invests in uh, all of these underground hospitals and uh, basements. You can't construct a building in Israel without a basement or a bomb shelter. So nakita mo all the people in uh, Ukraine that were saved all had uh, were rescued from basements. So very important yung use of basements. Tayo walang basements mga bahay natin eh. And you see naman the aerial photo of Mario Paul talagang flattened siya. So if that were bombs thrown at the Philippines or an area of the Philippines, kahit ano pa yan, kahit uh, Corinthians or Forbes Park, ubus yung tao talaga. Kasi hindi naman tayo standard na nanggagawa ng basement. So the very important yung training. In fact, yung hospital namin sa Kim Sheba, I had the decontamination showers. And the decontamination showers were placed in the parking lot in the back. So that uh, when, uh, when they did their drills, the people that were contaminated before they were brought in were decontaminated in the parking lot in an open air where they would be washed thoroughly. So yun the mga things that we need to actually think about how to decontaminate people who are uh, affected by agents, similar to the ammonia experience. So yun lang muna, Susie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Okay, um, Raymond, we have a question from the audience. Let's pick that up. Okay, thank you, Dr. Susie. We have already uh, well promoted Dr. Joseph Tortona, one of our avid uh, uh, listeners and uh, viewers po, no, to be able to ask his question. I'm not sure if our camera is working, Dr. Tortona, but please go ahead uh, with your question. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir, loud okay. and clear. My, probably my question was, was a little bit wrong. I asked if the LGUs are orient, properly oriented on CBR and E events. Probably the best question would be, are they trained to handle CBR and E events? Or will they just rely on the national government to interfere? Okay, Look, thanks a lot. I think that's a great question. Let's throw that to April and then we'll ask uh, Irma and Ted also to respond. But Irma, uh, sorry, uh, April, You've been involved in some training, or has that been just PGH? Uh, so, yes, uh, with the PGH team, we were able to train with the BFP, the AFP, and uh, some uh, foreign groups then, uh, as partners. Uh, but so, not ano local, po? local government. No, um, for the, the, that question, for the LGUs, um, so, siguro awareness pa lang po ang uh, kulang pa no sa sa ating mga local sa local level. So, uh, awareness and then wala pa tayo we're not talking about the system yet no. So, doon pa lang po siguro malaki pa yung kailangan nating gawin. Thank you. Um Irma, you were raising your hand. Go ahead. 
I actually just wanted to stress, so all this training that we are getting is really part of a strategic plan. And the strategic plan is called the Philippine CBRN National Action Plan. So as I've said earlier, the UP College of Medicine was instrumental in finalizing that plan, and it became what is now known as the Anti-Terrorism Council Resolution 40 that also created what we call the CBRN National Team. So within that strategic document are specific recommendations. So one of them is actually increasing awareness at the level of the local government units. So over the during the pandemic, we were able to conduct four virtual training programs for the uh, uh, through the Department of Interior and local government. And we are now hoping that with the with the easing up of the restrictions, that we will be able to. Uh, do the operational level. So aside from just awareness level, train some of the people in the barangays to at least be able to recognize, first recognize and do some kind of uh, immediate action. And just to emphasize also that in terms of where we are in, in relation to equipment, we might not have all the equipment that we need to re fully respond to uh, CBRN, but at least we now have better equipment than what we had in 2001. In the case of uh, Bureau of Fire Protection, that's why I said when, the level, when we talk about levels of uh, personal protective equipment, we don't want our doctors and healthcare providers to be in a level A PPE. I tried that before when I was younger <laughs> in 2007, and really the amount of sweat that I had on my boots was really tremendous. So uh, when you do those procedures uh, of, you know, intubating a patient, you don't want to be in level A. So you let the Bureau of Fire Protection, who has the proper equipment, scan the area. They, they do that, uh, what they call it, um, uh, you, you, they enter first, they determine what are the most toxic chemicals, if there's radionuclear material, and then they give feedback to the health people so that they can don the proper PPE. So... In, in most of the circumstances for decontamination, we want the doctors to be at least at the very least um, or at the highest maximum containment of a level B PPE, which means that you have removed the uh, fully encapsulated suit, but you still have a self-contained breathing apparatus in your back so that whatever contaminants there are, you can still protect yourself. So there's really a lot more that we need to train our medical people for. Uh, and again, uh, just to maybe help um, people recognize their efforts now. So with the COVID-19 pandemic, we recognize one of the gaps of the local government units. They do not have a, a laboratory, really, that is owned by the LGU so that people can... Um, so we now have a project that we are engaging again with one of our international donors. We are going to build... Uh, a minimum of three, at least at the level of what we call a biosafety level two plus laboratory, which so that we can address better the surge of infectious disease. We are now uh, trying to build this in low resource because uh, we, we know that in Manila we have built these molecular labs, but what if it happens in a remote area? So the only question we're trying to deal with now is sustainability. If we build it there, how will the local government unit sustain the laboratory? So these are just some of the things that we are doing with the local government unit. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irma. You know, I wish we had more time, Raymond, but I think we're out of time and we have to, to wrap up. And we're already seeing in the chat that uh, people are asking for part two training and all of that. And Irma and I have been exchanging on text that maybe we will think about a specialized training on this. I mean, it's timely. I think there's going to be reception to it. Anyway, so Raymond, you want to, um, so we're going to give our, uh, we're going to give our, uh, our speakers a couple of minutes to think about their parting words. But meanwhile, Raymond's going to answer the questions and uh, give the evaluation. Go ahead, Raymond. Okay, thank you so much to our panel of experts. Bitin po, no? Pero hopefully we'll be able to get you again for another, <clears throat> well, a third part of, our, of this discussion. For our fun quiz, do we have two questions again? Uh, nasagot naman na ito ni Dr. April, but we'll call her again just to reiterate. The first question reads, what is the most common route of exposure of hazmat incidents? Kung kayo po ay nakikinig, alam nyo na po ang sagot, but let's... Uh, Allow Dr. April to reiterate po.
Ma'am April. Uy, nawala si April. Sagutin mo na lang, Raymond. Nawala. <laughs> so, ang tapong kasagutan is the one selected by 67% at least on the Zoom. Inhalational. Yun po, <laughs> Raymond. Um, ah, okay. Inhalation. Yun po, okay. yun po ang tamang kasagutan. And then for our second question, thank you. Medyo gumagana na po ang ating mentee. Uh, yun. For exposure to solids or liquids, rapid removal of clothing, is the single most important step in decontamination. It removes blank of contaminants po. So, ano po ang porsyento? Ang porsyento pong pinakamataas, at least in the Zoom, 48%, 75% to 80%, at 52% naman po sa menti. So, ano po ang tamang kasagutan? We'll call in Sir John for this question. Sir, 80 to 90% yan. Ayun, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir John. So, ano po, for our participants, pakitandaan lang po ang tamang kasagutan. Uh, we'll give a few more moments uh, so that Dr. April can also come in and join us uh, as we go on to the evaluation poll. Sana po ay gumagana rin po siya. At, uh, can we have that on the screen? Okay, so uh, um, there are five questions po, and of the five questions, uh, ito po ay, ay four-point Likert scale. I'll just read them uh, as I go through the list. Um, number one, the panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. Number two, the panelists were well-prepared and organized. Number three, the panelists were spoke clearly and audibly. Number four, the panelists used appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained. And number five, the panelists contributed to new perspectives and knowledge on managing various key COVID-19 health issues. Hindi po namin isasara muna ang evaluation poll. At ulitin ko lang po, wala po kaming hiwalay na evaluation poll. Ito lang po yung meron po kami. As we move back for the final messages of our speakers for today. Dr. Susi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Raymond. Okay, so parting messages. First, we'll start with John. John, please go ahead. Um, actually, uh, I only have two um, two points as my parting message. So, uh, first, uh, preparation is half the battle. So, no matter how difficult it is, uh, as long as we have some sort of preparation, we have an edge to everything to, to be unknown or kahit anong kaharapin natin. And next, uh, um, Continue to be curious. Um, wag tayo huminto. Uh, alamin yung mga bagong uh, knowledges, uh, mga emerging uh, subspecialization sa, sa profession natin. Kasi the moment na huminto tayo na, na maging curious, the learning stops. Yeah. So, yun. Be curious, uh, learn, and then in preparation. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Um, April. Hi. Hello po. So for me po as an emergency medicine uh, specialist po, ang um, very critical sa akin is that uh, we are open no, to learning new skills and uh, open to new knowledge, uh, especially when it comes to management of uh, uh, potential uh, emergencies. So itong CBRN is uh, a new field. No? Uh, marami pa tayong kailangan matutunan. And uh, which leads me to my second point, that there is a need for coordination and communication among the different agencies no, involved in uh, responding to such incidents. So uh, for that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. April Yaneta. Okay, we'll go to Irma. Well, um, actually, uh, I think the message I'd like to impart right now is that um, tackling a topic on CBRN, which was probably not something that was popular in the past, is very timely now because of we can see that there is a really a need to have more people trained. But again, uh, it, as I've said, I think I placed it in the chat that the whole response is actually multi-sectorial. And therefore, we are part of that particular response. We have to acknowledge the strengths of the other agencies and we should not actually fight with them in a scenario uh, so that we can actually have a more coordinated action. And I think that when we talk about 
science and technology, we also have to be aware of the developments in science and technology that may add to the harm. Uh, and I always want to believe that knowledge is key. But and again, in this, and science and knowledge are linked together, but the aim of science is not to have uh, is to set a limit to infinite error because in the end, we don't want to be able to have terrorism also in our means. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Irma. And thank you for joining us all the way from France. Um, Ted, go ahead. Yeah, well, one of the first things I'd like to say is I'd like to thank Irma for being on this since we were very young. <laughs> since we, did, we have white have, hair. <laughs> well, white hair. The two of us now have white hair and the issues continue to evolve. And the first message I'll have is that, uh, yes, our capacity for uh, uh, CBR and e response isn't there yet like other uh, first world countries, but it's improved a lot from the time Irma and I were starting. And all the our DRRM offices just need to know is where to ask for help. There's Irma to call, and then there's the Bureau of Fire CBR and team, the AFP CBR and E team, and the, the PGH now. And then there are some private industries that also prepare based on the chemical hazards that they actually handle. So there will be a lot of uh, sharing of resources when we do encounter this. The key is for the region or the LGU to know where and who to ask help from. The second I'd like to... Uh, address is number, uh, a question that was placed in the Q&A that we failed to answer. It's asking about uh, triage when you do triage. And it's very important that when you deal with chemicals and all these biologicals and nuclear, it's the decon that happens first. April showed a very nice photo of the hot zone, the cold zone. Doctors never enter the hot zone. You're too precious to be lost. <laughs> so it's safety first no? for us responders. In the healthcare profession, you never enter the hot zone. It's the guys who are trained to wear those PPEs who are fit enough to stay for, what, a couple of hours only. I've worn those PPEs as well and tried to intubate and put IV lines in them because our training in the U.S. was like that. You have to wear the PPE and intubate and you'll do it 10 times slower than when you were not uh, wearing it. So it's very important that we consolidate our resources and our training, maybe regional uh, hazmat units uh, so that that, that that can respond to different regions of the Philippines where there is high risk for chemical uh, damage. And lastly, my most important message is that we have as a disaster guy, we have the DRRM framework. We have the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act. It has been focused on natural disasters but uh, we saw what happened. The uh, epidemiological emergencies were kept aside and we were hit by COVID-19. Let's make sure that when we encounter again a big CBRN event, that we are now ready. So we should actually follow the framework. The framework is there. Let's build from there, build capacity, build capability, stockpile the necessary equipment and consolidate all of this so that we can help one another. Thank you, Susie. Okay, thank you very much, Ted. Uh, Irma was raising your hand. Yeah. Very, just very one short. more. Yeah. Yes, very yeah. short. Just to respond to Ted's uh, comments. So just to let the people know that the Bureau of Fire Protection has a regional capability. So they have teams in Luzon, besides in Mindanao. And for the medical part, that's the other area that we're cap doing capability building, <laughs> capability building on. So um, before the pandemic happened, the equipment for Mindanao, for the SPMC actually arrived. It's still, I think, in the container van. Uh, we will do the training soon. Uh, we will probably request April and maybe John to go with us to Davao to start training the people in Mindanao. And as I've said, there are some equipment earmarked also for Cagayan de Oro, for Palawan, and also for Cebu. So there's that kind of uh, mindset now to really make sure that it's distributed not only in the Metro Manila area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irma. Okay, thank you so much. Clearly, we're out of time and clearly our community wants more of this. So we are going to discuss how we can continue the discussion. We're going to have a summary now from uh, the Deputy Director of the Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Uh, Stella Jose. Go ahead, Stella. Hi, everyone. Uh, it, again, it's a very informative webinar series. You know, I'm always glad to be here watching everyone. Uh, it's a nice review then because, you know, that was in med school when this was lectured to us. So 
uh, for the first, uh, I, I would just like to summarize uh, on a few uh, speakers. Though. So, uh, uh, April Yaneta mentioned, Dr. April Yaneta mentioned the CDR and E, okay? So, wag natin kalimutan yung E, which is the explosives. So, she mentioned yung hazmat versus CDR and E event. So, what's the difference? So, the intent and the scope, yun, yun ang difference. So, sabi ni April, yung hazmat is an accidental release, for example, of a toxin. It is non-weaponized. There is increased priority on safety of the personnel and the public, and it is a smaller scale, and you need uh, prior, there is prior knowledge or of potential. Unlike uh, the TBR and even there is deliberate use of this uh, weapons of mass destruction. So uh, again, she mentioned the mga risk scenarios. So there are natural and accidental causes, and the components of the response, such as detection, in identification, monitoring. And then again, your infection, infectious management, physical presence, and the hazardous management. What is the role of the healthcare provider, healthcare worker? Uh, first, you assist the responders, uh, you receive the casualties, and you manage the casualties in uh, the PPE and the skills that's necessary. So she mentioned about chemical agents. We have the inhalational transdermal, ingestion, and injection. So, natutuwa nga ako dun sa mga uh, attendants natin. No? Talagang ganado sila mag-answer ng ating call. And, you know, that's really something. So, uh, that's very nice. So, the questions that we should ask, who will be affected, what, where, when, why, and how. So, ngayon, ano, we know that there's a war going on in Ukraine. And there are already uh, 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 mga pa, pa, patunog na baka magkaroon ng chemical or biological warfare. You know, I think we should really uh, delve on this some more kasi we'll never know it might really happen. No? And uh, kay, uh, our nurse, John Bernard, uh, John Bernard Bernardo, no? I appreciate your lecture. Ganyan ko lang na-realize kung gaano kahirap yung, yung sinusuot niya na level A P P E. Okay, kasi ako nagahasmat din ako when I do OR sin PGH, pero ibang klase yung hasmat nila Bernard. Sobrang init talaga, makita mo lang talagang tutulo ang pawis mo. So it is self-contained. There's a cooling vest and you are fully encapsulated. So syempre you also want to protect yourself. And what struck me with what you said, you should have time 30 minutes to go in and 30 minutes to go out dapat hindi maubos yung oxygen that you're that you're using and of course from Dr. Irma Macalino si Irma icon yan talaga dito sa PGH talagang ano yung Bureau of Fire Protection talagang binigyan siya ng special award i think kumbaga isang webinar natin si Irma lang yung magsasalita ay walang magrereklamo and thank you for for coming here uh, for attending uh, despite your you're in France, we know, and you know, it's very, we're very grateful for all the knowledge that you shared. And she was, we mentioned that and she was sa 911. And you know, that's really something, you know, just watching it from TV is already frightful. And being there yourself is additional, you know, additional, uh, I'm sure, tension and stress for you. Thank you very much for all those uh, participants who uh, answered our poll. Back to you, Susie. Oh, thank you so much. So that's our Deputy Director for the Philippine General Hospital. Excellent summary, uh, Stella, Marie, Ligaspi, Jose, and uh, we always look forward to some kind of closing summary so that we can cap our knowledge for the day. Okay, next week. Nice topic. Okay, very exciting. We are going to talk about vaccination of children six years old and above. Don't miss it. Again, we will bring you our best speakers and, uh, you know, we are campaigning for vaccination of children, pero what do we need to know? What is the status of this? Whatever questions you have on vaccination of children. Thank you so much. Raymond, over to you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director Stella Jose. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Uh, for next week po, no, as mentioned by Dr. Susie, again, we'll be tackling something that uh, we want to be able to gain more 
um, awareness po with regards to the pediatric vaccination. So not just the elderly but also the pediatric uh, population po will need, uh, well, mas maikting pa pong push for more vaccination. But before we conclude our program, let us first acknowledge the very hardworking team behind the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. Uh, without each and every one of you, we won't be able to churn out quality content po week in week out we were really impressed na marami po ang nag-attend for this topic for this week uh, and something that we hope will be sustained in parts 3 and parts 4 of our continuation for this topic uh, we also would like to let you know that all stop covid deaths webinars are archived for viewing at the TVUP YouTube channel so if you just go to www.youtube.com forward slash TVUPPH, you'll be able to see all 92 webinars to date. Uh, and then after the, this webinar, ilalagay na rin po namin ang webinar number 93. We also understand that all of you are busy and jam-packed, uh, hectic po ang inyong schedule. So we have also prepared. So kung matutulog po kayo or anything nasa bus or, or nakokommute, we have prepared our YouTube short spot. These are just snippets, very, very uh, easily consumable po dahil may kli lang po siya. But meron, malaman po siya ng mga short video clips of our webinars. We hope that something that will be uh, mas, ma mas magugustuhan po ninyo dahil hindi po siya ganun po kasing haba ng aming mga archive ng mga episodes. We are also seeing on the screen um, the, uh, at least 90% po of our attend oh, sorry, yes, like 89 to 90% of our attendees uh, chose strongly agree for our evaluation for today's webinar. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. We really are out of time. It's just unfortunate uh, that that's the case. So this formally brings our webinar for this week to a close. Uh, Makita-kita po tayo again next week, Friday from 12 noon to 2 p.m. It's a date. Together we can stop COVID deaths. So keep safe, keep healthy. See you online. The enemy remains unseen. I'll keep your hand in mine. Let's say a prayer one more time. I know you long for home, but I am here, you're not alone. I'll stay with you until the coast is clear. The others pain before my fears, the others laugh before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask. Do I have strength to carry on? Oh God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'm here to hold the line. I'll keep my word until my time. Just slip into my eyes and say his name to realize. It's fine to be afraid. Just hold on to the word he gave. This time will come to pass Cause this salvation's made to last He'll carry you to see the break of day The others pain before my fears The others vows before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'm here to hold the line. I'll keep my word until my head dies. From my fears, the others laugh before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask, Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong, I'll keep my word, you word is mine. The others 
pain before my fears I'm pushing on the spice of tears Please take us through another day Just hold my hand And I will hold the light I will